Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Everhart Museum's Second Sunday Folk Arts Series. We have the honor and the pleasure of every second Sunday of the month coming to you to introduce new traditional and folk artists. My name is Kimberly Crafton, and I am the Folk and Traditional Arts Coordinator at the Everhart Museum. And across our six county region, which covers the Pocono Mountains, which would be Wayne and Pike County, and we also cover the, La the Lackawanna and Luzerne County in the valley, and then in the Endless Mountains, we cover Wyoming and Susquehanna County. And across that enormous geography, we have a number of people from sometimes various countries, but certainly from various cultural backgrounds that have spent their life as traditional artists, as folk artists, most as teaching artists as well, trying to be that link that connects the traditions of the past through them and their experiences into the future so that their traditional art can carry on. But on the way, they have their own journeys and that's what this show is all about. What is the journey that they undertook in perfecting, none of them will ever say they perfected their art, but in learning and in continuing to learn and then in teaching and passing on their specific art form. And today we are in the studio of Peg McDade, a multi-faceted, a very textured and studied fiber artist. And we would love to talk with her today about all of the different paths that she has gone on as she has continued her studies. So here we are, Peg. Thank you so much for allowing us to come in and for a moment be one of your students, one of your friends and confidants to learn a little bit more about you. And I've had the pleasure of working with you for a long time and over the many, many conversations and years, I, I know one thing and that is that I know nothing. And um, it would take us months to figure out how to begin to unpack the complexity of fiber arts. And um, I know we'll do a little bit about that today, but we really hope to learn an awful lot about you as well. So thanks for welcoming us. It is my pleasure and absolute honor to have you here mm -hmm. and to be part of the Everhart, which does such fantastic community work. So true, so true. So we, we've talked so much about traditional arts and folk arts, but I think what it comes down to is at the very heart of it, you have to have an artist first. You have to have a culture, you have to have something that, that causes not only you know the need for uh, personal expression, but but you know what do you feel is is an artist, and we can start there, and then maybe go on into your own journey in that. Well, let's let's get to the word folk art, oh. which is where we are. It's very very hard to define folk art because it does reach so many cultures, so many different types of arts, from music and poetry, mm -hmm. uh, you know literature, pottery, metalwork, and the fiber arts, which I'm in. So I like to think of the folks that I'm dependent on, mm. and they are my teachers too. And they go back 40,000 years to the upper Paleolithic age when somebody decided, oh, I can make a string out of this plant. Mm -hmm. So those are my heroes, and I go to the ancient Peruvians uh, to find out about knitting. And I go down to New York to look at the tapestries at the Cloisters, mm -hmm. which is a vaunted wing of the Metropolitan. I recommend everybody go to the Cloisters that was once, but there where the uh, marvelous tapestries are. And so um, I'm, I feel indebted to anybody that was a master artist of their time. And, and in 40,000 years, there have been many times to study. So oh, yes. you'll never, ever run dry of, of concepts and, and techniques. There's that idea of um, you know study, which is what has impressed me so much about you, because You've never been content to just learn a technique. You need to know the history behind it and what happened prior to that. And you know, you really follow it 
back at the fact that you know that it was 40,000 years worth of history shows how deeply you've studied it. And I know you have an extensive library that we'll, we'll look at some books later on, but what got you so interested in delving into the, the technique of it, the, the, which when you find out about the technique, you have to therefore then know the history which caused that. What, what got you interested in all of that? And do we go back to my childhood? We can. We, we hope before we, we study. Hope we would. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I recall uh, standing alongside my grand aunt uh, sewing on one of those pedal machines where the feet went up and mm -hmm. down, and uh, watching her make lace ruching mm -hmm. and putting lace on garments, which I believe I would wear in a day or two. So uh, all the other kids are outside playing in the sun, and I am standing. As long as she would be at that machine, I would be right there. So wow. that was it. My, her sister, my grandmother, um, did silk embroideries. And I had those for a very long time. Um, I had an uncle who was a quilter, and I kept his silk quilt for many, many years. So I think it's in the blood somehow. Okay, I think as far as an artist, you don't acquire uh, you don't acquire to be an artist. You are born with it or you're not. I think I, I have to agree with that because when it becomes a you, you don't say the word obsession because it's not, but it's a it's a need. You must participate in whatever that expression of, of yours is and in your case, you must have be creating something with the hands well, of the fabric. Yes, but underneath that is drawing and composition all the mm. time and uh, senses of space. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a jacket, which I have. Uh, you have some photos of that. Mm -hmm. And um, it takes the human form and turns it all the way around. You can't stop and look at the front of the jacket assume the back is the same, assume that the, the sleeves are going to be the same. You can't even assume that the sleeves are going to be the same color. So um, I like that little play, it's just uh, making sport, as it were, of commercial things that we see on racks in stores. What are, I mean, I'm, so we're, because you're sitting at a loom as we're talking, and I'm sure we'll talk about this shortly, but you're dealing in a, what looks to us, like a two-dimensional activity. My brain is sculptural. And from your brain, it's sculptural. So not only in its two dimensions is it sculptural already, but then you take that piece of fabric that you've made, and now you're truly turning, you're turning it into a garment that someone will wear, and now it's like multi, you know, it's even beyond three-dimensional yes. because it's a, it's a three-dimensional object in motion That's because right. you have to picture the person inside of it and how they move and where they need space and flexibility. And exactly. That's so we do a lot of measurements. Uh, uh, people often ask me to do something for them and it is one only, so I make a pattern based on their actual body, their measurements, um, in some cases, uh, for example, with my mother, I would drape stuff, stuff directly on her body because I knew her body so well uh, that I didn't have to make a pattern. But uh, in general, I have patterns for everything that you see. So there will be a, a grid pattern with the proper measurements on it, depending upon whether it's north, south, east, or west. Uh, multi-axis <laughs> or on the bias yeah. and uh, yes so um, pattern making is actually sculpture yeah. I have to stop a moment and just say that there really is no way to adequately express in the short period of time that we have the breadth of Peg's interest levels and years of practice in creating a variety of fiber arts from rugs to weaving, to crochet, 
to knitting to applique and reverse applique that all involves stitching as well and then we go into the as she said the one only clothing that she creates as well as tapestries and sculptures literal sculptures art sculptures made out of her weaving so again we're going to be doing just a kind of a race through just to get to know this marvelous woman and tell you a little bit more about her was quite a list that you said right there. Well, it's your fault. If you weren't so interested no. in all these things, we wouldn't have to say all those things. <laughs> well, you missed a big one. Yeah. Would you? <laughs> I do very large um, sculptural pieces yeah. for buildings. For the build, right. For, Be for beyond buildings. just for smaller yeah. pieces. So uh, since they're in the buildings, we don't have them in the, in the studio. I do and have photos, though, so I'll do share them. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that would be fine, but that's a um, major commitment, usually working with somebody within that institution or building and working with architects. And uh, It is a literal installation, which needs huge, planning huge. from every single person along the way. Oh yeah, huge yeah. installation. So the idea of fiber as three-dimensional and beyond is, is really exciting to those of us who maybe appreciate it and love it, but aren't involved in the um, understanding of it. You've talked to me about the structure inside of a single piece of woven cloth. Can you give us just a little bit of an idea of that before we go into some other things? Because I think it'll lay the groundwork for people to further understand what we're talking about as we talk about some of your pieces later. Every woven textile is woven in what is called a certain structure. So the sheets on your bed mm -hmm. are called plain weave. You know, 50% of them up, 50% of them down, and then they interlock. So that's plain weave. That's a structure. Uh, summer and winter, which is a delightful term, is another structure. And we have some on our little loom that I have here when I give demonstrations to uh, community groups or to uh, students. For example, I took them down to the Everhart Museum mm -hmm. where we did some weeding on uh, noble cardboard looms. And uh, but he wanted them to see how something would be made on a table loom. Right. Um, so there are many, many structures. One might be biter bond, another would be lawn pots. So you get out your weaving book and you say, wow, I had no idea. All I knew were the twills. So there are many, many twills. It's not all herringbone. So um, the thing to do is you really have to know what the term structure means. Right. And it means a type of textile was woven in a certain way. And that's where that third dimension comes in because you're not just doing as you were calling the you were talking about our sheets and oh, they were yes. you know in almost that's almost two dimensional uh, you know yeah it does it, take up some space <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but um, yes the the third dimension might come when you're doing pattern weaves mm -hmm. and they leave uh, what are called floats which are on the top of the textile and while you're doing that, there's no reason why you can't pick up a little bit of yarn and tie a knot in it or add a braid or something. So um, many people, once you're past the beginning, once you're past the beginning, it's fun to play around with how to do these kinds of things and not always think of it as flat. Mm. Okay. And I think that's the first step you have to enter into to really comprehend the beauty that's in each piece that we'll be seeing of yours. So as you are looking at the photographs and different things that Peg has created, do look for that complexity and imagine how difficult it would be to create that. In First, it has to happen in your concept. Yes. 
Yeah, that's right. The planning is <clears throat> unbelievable. To and me. You don't jump into some of these complex moves. You really have to. There's a system that we start in with the what well, plain weed is in all of them, but then you would go to the twelves, and one of the fun twelves is something called crackle. They have great names. And uh, then you, once you move from crackle, you might try summer and winter. And um, then you might say, well, yeah, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready for something else. And as you find, as you go through these, you find out that each one of these structures is a little more limiting than the ones before. I mean, crackle, you can play around forever. And, uh, but some of these others with biter bond, it's much harder to have this, uh, I don't know what you're calling the freedom, because this is, the loom is set up in such a way that you've got to do what it tells you to do, mm -hmm. and you're free. Uh, uh, we were showing uh, Kim some looms before. Your feet may be fine treadling on four treadles, but when you get to eight treadles, you have to know what you're doing, and then. This loom that I'm sitting at has 12 treadles. So now you're into paying attention. The loom out in the front, uh, near the front door, and we're going to show you that loom, has 14 treadles. So you don't sit down as a beginning person and try and figure that one out because you're going to be very frustrated. I, I can't even comprehend. So, so if you can imagine right here as you're looking at the loom, one at a time. These are the treadles that she's talking These about. These are the shafts. The shafts. And the treadles pick them up. They're, okay, so there's eight of those. This is a very fine loom. And so you're thinking she has to be have it planned out before she even begins what's happening in this direction with the strings that are first. And how long does that this, this is the warp. take so. to set up the warp for, for just a... For even just for the beginner couple of twills. That little table loom over there mm -hmm. to set it up would be at least six hours, but that is not taking into account all your planning and deciding what uh, your what structure you're going to use. Mm -hmm. And um, then you have to do a sampler. We talked about samplers mm -hmm. before. If you don't do a sample and you start running in, you're going to find out, oops, I treaded this wrong. Oops, I picked up the wrong treadle. Oops, you know, you have to correct. You're not, we never say errors and we never say mistakes. We say that a little something happened I have to attend to. <laughs> okay, so we're very easy on ourselves. And, and you learn the term unweave. Oh, unweave is very fine. Right? It takes a little, little bit longer to unweave, but you should do it when you have to. Yeah. A few steps back saves you a lot of That's right. heartache going forward. Exactly. And, and forgive me for, for you know, kind of spending time here, but I, need, I really have a heart to have people understand the time and the patience and the planning. You don't just sit down and jump, 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 do something. You ha it's a, it is a method. It is, it's methodical and it has real purpose behind every single way that a thread enters into that design. And yeah. it has to be pre-thought out. So it's, I want them to get an idea of... This one might take me a week to set up. Yeah. I'm talking about, let's call it the administrative design and the planning and all of that. And then for each of these, I did a sampler about so high to see if I had made any and then we are then corrected those and then went on ahead. So um, I would say for me, and I know how to do it, it would be a week. For a student, it might take them first, first of all, the planning and uh, deciding on your structure, yeah. going through a number of books, looking at samples of this and that, and then saying, well, I want this one. So now I'm going to set up the loom. It, uh, we have 10-week classes here. And I would say that by the end of the 10 weeks, which is only three, we have three-hour studios. Yeah. So at the end of the 10 weeks, a person who's really sticking to it might be able to start to sit down and 
begin to do their uh, investigation. We can't call it sample. We can't call it. We, we, we don't say that. <laughs> we don't say any, anything ever. We investigate to see how we did, yeah. and then do those corrections yeah. if they need be. And that might be might take the thirty hours of a person in a class. And this is and this then is they so usually beautiful. continue on and go to the next class. Yeah. Well, at that point you have to because you're hooked. Because you, know, you need absolutely. to see if it, how it's going to go. For I have on. everything here. People don't rent their rooms. I, they just use my yeah. rooms. I have a dozen rooms, and so we we pick. Uh, right now we have people on on a sixty inch wide room. We have another on a fifty inch wide room. Wow. This one is a forty two. So I mean everybody is working at their proper uh, rate and proper every, everybody was a beginner at some point absolutely and and continue every new idea you come up with you're a beginner at that pattern or that new idea oh, yes. or so you're, you're continually a, a novice even when you have a skill set to get through some of the early part a little faster you're still hitting you, it you for the first about, time um, you know the artistic side of it mm -hmm. there isn't a time when I take something off and say that part is okay. I'll leave that one that way. How could I have changed it to make it better? Mm -hmm. Every time, and I've been doing this a long time. My first show was in 1972. And I did all rugs. And some of them were Aria rugs. And some of them were Grackle rugs and so forth. Mm -hmm. They all sold, which surprised the heck out of me. But I, I had a loom delivered to the gallery, and then I sat there and talked to the people and demonstrated, mm -hmm. and all of those walked out the door. I don't know where some of them are at this point. Right. Well, but sure, they still have life and color, and because I know you use only the finest materials. Oh, yeah. I know High, you. Highest quality. Yeah. Not worth your time and energy to put even one thread that is junk. Did you, through your family, did you have any lessons or were you just kind of absorbing their uh, fiber arts energy mm -hmm. and then you took, you know, then you took studies on your own mm -hmm. later on? Well, we, when we were in high school, I have two sisters and the three of us were signed up by my father and he never asked and said, you will be taking sewing lessons at the Singer Sewing Machine place in Scranton. And I really enjoyed it. My younger sister never went back, although she can, you know, sew, use a sewing machine. And my older sister said, no, that's not for me. So I took a second course in tailoring, and that the first one was basics, and then the second was in tailoring, and the third one was in making household items. So that could be drapery or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. And we've talked about that um, household items being more, you know, that's, it was assumed that you would also need to make utilitarian items, you know, from clothing to, to household goods. Well, clothing is utilitarian. Exactly. And I, I prefer to use the word functional because if you have a rug, it's functioning on the yeah. floor. If you have a tapestry, it's functioning on the wall. If you have clothing, it's functioning on your body. So um, to think of something as utilitarian as something, something lesser than fine art, that is a bad idea. It is a bad way to, to look at art. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have the folk art at the Everhart if we always looked at utilitarian things as being something lesser than, and all of these people were um, artists in every way. Right. And that's what I love about you, is that you are, you are careful about everything that you do, and you pay attention to words. 
So yeah. in that, you have that, that beautiful saying, you know, this needs a better term. And I, I liked your, your terminology much better than, you know, the traditional terminology has been utilitarian, but it, it leaves so much of the well, heart of folk and traditional well, art is utilitarian, of, but right. it's not art unless you decide to make it art. I mean, but for the most part, it, you just use it on the floor. That's right. And that, to me, is what is uh, conjured up in some people's mind of is what utilitarian is. So, and certainly, as we were talking about, you know, fiber and clothing, at fiber as clothing was necessary for us as humans in the past. And yeah. so, you know, it was from the very beginning, it had that functional need. And then it's what we do with it over time that came to be called fashion and came to be called, you know, this well, and that. And that, that brings us back to the 40,000 years that you, you mentioned before. Uh, my, my friend, the folk artist from the Paleolithic age, <laughs> I mean, I'm really thankful for all of these people. They discovered plants could be made into strings. And the first strings were from short plants, but then later on we had uh, plants in the hemp uh, category, as linen is. And they also find out that if you take two strings and twist them together, they're stronger. And this was way back. so. I'm dependent on of those all of those people that figured that out. So they're my folks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and and what you have done with all of their knowledge, not only for your own enjoyment, but then taking it and turning it into these beautiful pieces of functional art. <laughs> um, but also, Peg has been teaching for most of her career. On top of that, so um, you have taught classes in just about every fiber art that we mentioned before. Uh, and, and one of them I found most uh, enlightening for me was to teach history of costume. Because mm -hmm. it places it places you back there with those people. I mean, if you were Greek and you needed a chiton to wear, then you had a weaved right then and there. You did not go down to your local store and take it off the rack. So, um, I'm, as I keep saying, I'm dependent on those people. I'm dependent on the early, very early Peruvians mm -hmm. for the fantastic, complicated knitting that they do, and the complicated uh, tapestries that were used as bolos to swing in the air and knit something. Mm -hmm. I have one, by the way. That is the excitement of it is when you when you catch that spirit of there was an artist behind this someone thought this through someone took the knowledge of the people behind them and then applied it in this new way and now something new is possible and then someone else took that and either through art or for better utility slash functionality um, then we have something new that the next generations build on and you really do, when you get into that human side of it, it does give you goosebumps. Mm -hmm. Because you realize it's one artist teaching another, and this chain has continued for over 40,000 years. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Uh, right here in the United States, we can go back to the colonial era, into the 17th century, and we have uh, looms not as elegant as the ones that we have today. Um, but. Those people needed to grow the sheep, grow the marigolds. Let's start with the sheep first. <laughs> Let's start with the sheep. And, and yes, the and, and take care of the sheep and feed the sheep. And, yeah. uh, you know, then the next thing was you had a, uh, to dye something a different color. You would uh, use uh, marigolds or you would use plants that would yield blue or plants that would yield brown. and. Um, the, these particular things we absolutely take for granted when we walk into a yarn store and say, I want that one. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why people had one dress up thing to wear and one or two items to wear during the week when they weren't going to church. So um, I keep thinking of them all the time. I use uh, 
over colonial overshot. And you what is what is that? Colonial overshot is a twill. It's a certain structure of it twill. Is, it's a structure. You use the word. Sorry. <laughs> and um, that that particular structure of colonial is okay. Now I know how to to, to do um, a twill, a basic twill. But now I'm going to fool around with that twill a little bit, and I'm going to make it so that I can do all kinds of patterns with it that I couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So they came up with something called, and it's called colonial overshot. I imagine the people in the colonial era did not call it colonial. <laughs> they said, right. I'm going to weave something on the loom. So uh, we have all kinds of many, many, many uh, museums have these early things. And uh, I mean, you go down to the, make an appointment at the uh, Textile Museum in uh, Washington. You can go to the Renwick in Washington. You can uh, definitely go to the massive um, display of fibers at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. So I do this. I have to do it. It's, the, it's the scholar the in artist. me. The <laughs> scholar in me has to know all these things. The curse of the artist. The you, got, you can call it the scholar I'm, if you'd like, but you know, it's the curse of the artist. Okay. I must. <laughs> it, uh, it's a positive obsession. Yes. <laughs> when you go to the museums, do you do you take um, what is the glass that you look through to really be able to see clearly the the detail of the structure yes, of the I piece? Yes, I have such a glass. What are they called? Why can't I remember that? I don't remember what they're called at all. Oh, yeah. It's like a. It, it's <laughs> I'm so like, glad you can't either. It's, it's like a, a jeweler's yeah. uh, magnifying glass. Yeah. Yeah. I have so that you can really. And I would just not call all it a jeweler's magnifying glass. I don't know. Right. And not all of them you can get close enough to. You know, the guards may keep you back or so, I'm guessing. But, yes. Yeah. But those ones that you can, you must learn so much just uh, by. There, on occasion, um, these back rooms are opened up. And I was lucky enough to be in the Fiber Museum at uh, Cranbrook Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took us into the back and we were able to open the drawers and see all the basketry that's there. Little tiny basket, baskets so small they will fit on your, they will fit on your fingers and onto larger ones. And I do have a basket collection too. I hope it, well, you're, you have, you, into making things go like this together. So. <laughs> but I mean, um, if you ever have uh, the ability to go in the back rooms of museums, that's where so much stuff is that yeah. can't be put out because there's so much of it. Yeah. Is it possible to to decide that you have one favored art, or do you spend equal time between all of them, or do you just get a, I need to crochet now, or I? Well, uh, well, how do you? Do uh, in you? August, I get this um, absolute uh, desire to knit, and I have a student who is now knitting, and she, I said, okay, well, we're going to do uh, moss stitch, mm -hmm. and uh, so what do I do? I do five or six different moss stitches as a sampler for her, and so. Uh, then I think, hmm, I'm going to use that in some way. Uh, another thing that we were doing were basket stitches, mm. basket weave stitches. And um, so she said, well, I'm going to do three or four of them, or five maybe, which means she's really moving along and knitting. And I said, I'm going to do this one that's at the end. And I said, it's not, you're not quite ready for it, but by the time you get there, you will be. Mm. And um, it was fascinating to me, and so I did a scarf of it. Is that the one that you said just came off the... This one. So, do you mind if I touch it? No, please touch. Oh, wow. And so it's um, double basket weave. Double basket weave, so that it's coming up on one side and there's a down, down, you can see the intertwining of the basket style coming up and then the next layer goes down so that if I flipped it over that would they be will the side coming up. Is that accurate? Yes. It's a, it's different on the other mm -hmm. side. See, let's do it this way. See the two Z's here? Mm-hmm. 
we'll flip it over and you will have three Z's over here. Right. So the two Z's are in that area right there. Gotcha. Yeah. I love it. So, and then they, I crocheted the edge. For those that don't know, the difference between knitting and crocheting would be? Knitting is called vertical interlooping. Mm -hmm. You know that if you get a hole in a knitted something and you just keep on pulling on it, it will make a run right down. That's the vertical interlooping going this way. Crochet is both vertical and horizontal interlooping. So I teach interlooping. Some of it's vertical, some of it goes horizontal and vertical. <laughs> so that, I mean, to get into how it works. Right, and yeah. that's again a structural issue, not so Absolutely. much, you know, because I know that the knitting needles have the two, you know, two points and then the crochet One is hook. usually a hook at the end, but it's not so much about the tool as much as it is about the structure of the The, the tool fibers makes the structure work right. oh. as long as you are thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it always comes back to that. You can't go into any fiber art if you want it to be both beautiful and functional without the planning process. I don't know how you could. Right. I don't know how you can set up a loom without a whole lot of planning. So this is another example of many different things coming into play in one. Can you tell us what's happening in this piece, Peg? Yes. Well, of course, we talked before about making measurements. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to say that this would be a size 12, uh, 10 or 12. And so that might be a medium size. So you use the measurements for medium. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the front and the yoke in the back, they are done in a crochet technique called Tunisian. And people say, well, that looks knitted. And everybody gets confused about Tunisian because it looks knitted. No, it was made by one hook. And knitting would be two knitting needles. It's done by one hook. So, um, you know, it's a it's an actual Tunisian hook, which is longer than mm. other hooks. And um, the pockets, by the way, on the edge, they're knitted right here in a knit one, purl one stitch. Okay. So the Tunisian, there's a vertical one that comes here. And when you get to the end of your needle, you put this little chain in be inside of the vertical ones. And that's what, if you come closer, there's the verticals right here. And inside is the little chain that keeps looping around here. Mm -hmm. And it makes a dense fabric, which has less stretchability vertically and horizontally. So using the same yarns that were used in here, but in a different way, um, those yarns go in and out here as they do coming down through here. So you just, I just wanted to knit that little fencing business that's going on there. And um, then the parts were stitched together and, and then crocheted with a single chain crochet going through here to put the two parts together. Yes, there was a pattern for the yoke a pattern for the front and a pattern for the back, which I make a large graph mm -hmm. uh, pellon. So this is just playing with the colors that are in it and <clears throat> using the motifs from the back and uh, amplifying them and using them uh, in the scarf. These are the same yarns that were used in the front here. When they knit it up, they look a lot different. So, um, and that's what's really nice about variegated yarn. You just don't know what it's going to do. 
So um, that's how these two work together. But uh, we talked about warp, but this is the weft. So we have those two words. So the warp is the part that's coming this way? The warp is in yes, the loom? Yes, it's taut on the loom. And the weft is what crosses the warp. What's wonderful about that, as you can see right here, these are the colors that are on the warp. But it's completely different colors coming, depending uh, on this. If I had used black in this, it would have dulled these very much. Mm. Okay, if I had used purple in this, it would change this completely. So you have the two things are necessary. And what is, it, what is uh, the mystery of this is you don't know how they're going to interweave. Right, until they touch each other. Until they touch and you do enough of it to see what the colors are doing with one another. So it's, it's something that weavers knew long before uh, George Sorrow in you know, kind of got the idea of pointillism oh, yes. in painting. Oh, yes. Weavers were, were struggling with this for thousands of years prior. We may, you may call it a struggle, I call it um, an adventure. Huh. I, I, I often use a whole, a lot of different colors, colors you would never think. I could say, well, uh, I think I'm going to throw yellow green into that one. And they go, wow, that's a cool color that comes up from that. So I, I often have stripes of different colors in my samplers before proceeding. And I'm looking at your vest as you're speaking and, and everything that you're wearing. I know that you, that you made that vest and it's demonstrating exactly what you're talking about. You can see the different bands of color coming down and how they interact with um, you know, the, the bands of color would have been the warp lines, mm -hmm. and then the how the weft interacts with each one of those bands of color and the warp is just, mm -hmm. it changes continually, and it's, it's almost, yes. and then as you move, it catches the light in different ways, and so now it's got a, a new dimension of light and reflection yeah, and refraction. And, and that's in the back of your mind, that you're going to have re reflection from those kinds of lines, yeah. Yeah. metallics. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you have this is the loom that I take uh, out of the studio. It's light enough for me to carry around. These floor looms don't travel easily. So uh, table loom. Um, I took this down at the Everhart when we were doing a master class down there, so that people could see. Um, uh, I would say um, a small way of doing it. This act by using your hand to push these up and down. So uh, there are four shafts on this one. And um, this is a summer and winter. Now, before we got to this part, here's the samplers that we used to see, different colors, but that's what you can do when you're weaving. Off of the same warp. Off the same warp. And yes. you can see those lines carrying right through from one to the other. And the see only difference here? is what you put in the weft. Yes. Mm. And then here's another sampler. To, to do, di to do different things. Oh, I can make checks with that. Oh, I can do large squares. I can do rectangles that do that. I can do columns. So you find out what you've done, what you've designed. You have to figure out if that's that's the wonderful mystery of the whole thing. And you have such a lovely um, array of colors and textures and um, thicknesses and thinnesses and elasticity and mm -hmm. you know oh, yeah. there's there, in every dimension possible that you have wonderful um, examples of different kinds of yarns and strings that you use. Uh, each one of these threads is called an end, an E and D. Okay, so that, that um, when, when you put these on here and you know that they're going to be taut and you know that you're going to introduce something in here and you know that you're going to beat them, 
then bees have to be strong in order, and then you have to know your fiber. Mm -hmm. You have to know each of the uh, types of yarn that you put in there. And you hope that, I, I actually try to break them. Mm -hmm. And if they break, I don't, I don't use them. So uh, something that will break really easily is a chenille. Mm -hmm. Pops right open. So it's a horrible thing to use in a warp. In a warp. In a warp, but yes, you could use a chenille in the web. Definitely. Yes, definitely. I love chenille. <laughs> <laughs> I think again, it's a thing that goes back to what what we loved about our grandmother's house. If we were lucky Soft. enough to know our grandmothers, and yeah. etc. There's um. Did you ever have a time when you just thought? this is too complex. I, I just have to stop here. I can't get involved in one, learning one more thing. I'm just, did you ever Never. reach, a, or did you Never. ever reach a point where you were had a frustration that you just couldn't get past? Never. Or? I bought four looms, and I did not know how to weave. Okay. <laughs> that answers your question. I went to an estate sale, and I said, I'll take that one and that one. I gave away three of them. They were looms that could be used in a school. Yeah. So I gave them away to a school. And then there was, uh, this was in an attic in a very large house, mm -hmm. and under the eaves was yarn from wall to wall. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say 40 feet of yarn in under the eaves. And I went to the, um, the lady and she says, well, how much would you want? And I said, all of it. Now, I had no idea whether it was good or bad. Right, 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 right. I had no idea if the mice had been at it or yeah. the squirrels or whatever. Yeah. So I didn't let it in the house. I had a nice broad wall, and I put all of this yarn out in the sunshine on a nice day. And then I threw away a good deal of it. And But it was very high quality, mm -hmm. all of it. And uh, yes, and that's the yarn that I used in order to learn how to weave. To begin. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs a beginning place, but you had been beginning long before. Long in before that. Life. Yes. Yeah. As, as every piece, you know, you're, you're teaching us that every piece begins long before even the first. It does. It, but then it, it's, um, I, I call it the, the filter. You have a filtering system. Yeah. You can be looking as you and I were at a beautiful sunset the other day, yeah. and we were talking about the colors, and look at that purple right mm. next to that orange. And how it changes each other. And how it changes, and it's getting darker, and the, and the value is changing right in front of our eyes. Right. And uh, that is now in both of our memories, and sometime it might come out that we will use a red orange next to a blue purple somewhere. Mm. Do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I do. That it's there. And uh, for me, I love to look at uh, the Crown Vetch in oh, our area. It's so great, isn't it? Yes, and it's huge, huge uh, patches of this. Yeah. So I did a tapestry, which is just called Crown Vetch. Mm. And um, year after year, I used to see that. And then I had to do it. Mm. I, and did I make myself? No, myself didn't know that I was going to do that. I was going to do that. Right. So that, that's what you're saying, that um, I'm, a, I'm a curious person, I would say, that way. Well, you're, you're also good at letting inspiration enter you and come out when it wants to. You don't try to force it like, I have to do a crown veg pattern right now. But you're holding that beautiful memory of the experience that you're having with the crown veg, and at some point, it will come out. It's also a Pennsylvania plant that, was, that yeah. came out of Penn State, and I, I felt very thankful to the people at Penn State for yeah. giving us this crown veg that covers up all the stuff that people throw on the road. <laughs> <laughs> you have traveled pretty extensively as well, and I know a lot of your travels have made it into your color scheme as something that particularly caught your eye or caught your soul and made a strong bond of memory that those have come out in your weaving schemes at times as well, yes? Yes, uh, indeed. Um, after I came back from Paris and um, I spent the day at um, Notre Dame, mm -hmm. I wanted to see architecturally how the building functioned 
You want to look at the functional structure? The functional, Isn't that the a function, shocking thing <laughs> that you would want I to I wanted the about? function of a cathedral, and I wanted to experience it. Yeah. Plus, I wanted to experience the organ, mm. which is um, soul-shattering when it really gets going. Uh, your body will uh, vibrate with that organ. Mm -hmm. um, I remembered the gorgeous windows and um, when I came back I did a weaving uh, in um, silk using the colors that were in the large weaving at the end of the cathedral mm. which the large uh, the large stained glass or the large weaving the, the large stained glass yeah. to, just remembering those colors yeah. and it was late in the day and the colors were uh, not screaming bright but you know they were rich yeah and that um, evening light changes the the evening the, light. versus a midday light everything is different right and it takes on that richness that you're that you remember right so I I did put that on a loom and I wove myself a jacket mm -hmm. and then a lady saw the jacket and she said what are you thinking about I said I'm thinking about Notre Dame Cathedral and I'm thinking about those Fenetra. And she said, well, weave me a jacket of Notre Dame color. So I, I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a photo of that. No, Some but, things but go out the door and you yeah. don't see them again. That's the hard part about being an artist is that something of your soul enters into it. And that capacity to, to let it go and let it live its own life without you anymore is, is challenging, but when you can do it, it's... It's a child that you let out into the world. There you go. There you go. You talked about influences in my life. Well, this is called the Three Aunties. And I was teaching a course for the Everhart up at the Dietrich Theater up in Tarkanic. And we had these wonderful people and what they were to do was to do a memory. And it's really hard to draw and put forward in real life a memory. But we were able to do that and we will have an exhibition of this work at the Everhart and at the Dietrich once our COVID problems are over. So these are my three aunties. These are the three aunties. And this was the oldest one of 13 children. And this was a grandmother. And this was um, Aunt Bridge, whom I never met. Her name was Bridget Etheldrida. No kidding. So this was the one that used to be at the sewing machine when I would work with her. So the things here, I lived in their home after they had died. I lived there for three and a half years, but so much of their things were still there. So this is the phone that was there way back to the 1920s. And this was the outhouse that was in the backyard. And this was a person who was working to remove the outhouse. And at the very same time, while bent over the outhouse, the gentleman's watch fell into the outhouse, not the part that you would like. <laughs> and so there he is holding up the outhouse while searching for his watch, which didn't go down too far and he got his watch out. Over here is the big window that I really loved and that big window was a bay window and there were trees here. The catalpa tree dropped a lot of those big... Um, like a bean or it's, something. It's right? like, it's a seed, seed pod, pod that has uh, beans on it and they used to stain everything. Uh, and so I put it in there because I really didn't like the catalpa tree. And so this is the toilet that was downstairs, which by the way worked. And so I left it in the house as I lived with it. When I sold the house, the people who bought it like that old toilet with the wonderful old tank up on the wall, mm -hmm. and they kept it too. They even had it 
uh, refurbished. So, uh, so that's its little giz its little uh, cooch that that was in. The people here. This is my grandmother, and her name was Anna Louise uh, Fitzhenry McDonald. Um, and she, this is me. Mm. I found an old photo, and she's holding me when my, I don't know what my age would have been at that point. That is me. There's my mother. And the MRM CD, Mary Rose McDade. Um, she was McDonald McDade, but apparently she dropped the McDonald and just went to McDade. And uh, this, uh, these initials were in her fur coat. So I saved them and put them into this. This is she, probably in her 30s. This is my daughter, Deborah. And so uh, we have then all the generations that I can touch. Okay, It was a little house in the backyard, which was so small that when you were in the kitchen, that was it. And there was a table, and then there was a door of a little tiny porch. If you stepped out on that porch, you probably had three feet to walk and you would step into the ground. So that's this little house. Um, it was kind of falling apart, so we had to raise it, which didn't make the former owners very happy. How did you decide to be a teacher? Because you were watching at your aunt's machine as she was doing these things and you knew you had the other fiber arts in your family and then you became healthily interested not obsessed right healthily interested <laughs> <laughs> in the fiber arts as well but what there's Our always a turn there's, there, there's there's always a turn into becoming a teacher what what made that turn for you that you wanted to be able to teach the, the example of my mother who graduated at the top of her class in college. My father graduated a valedictorian, or education was it. Absolutely. Uh, valedictorian from high school, salutatorian from temple. Um, I would say that, that the assumption that you will learn was never laid on us. It was always pleasant. And my mother was a teacher for 13 years before she married. And she would have been of the generation that would have had to give up her right. teaching. Right. But with her children, we sat around the dining room table, we did our homework, nobody was fighting. People got the homework done. My mother was in and out, looking around, answering questions, disappearing again, coming so forward. So you had at your daily table every single night, you had the example of what a teacher could do in a small group of people, each working independently on something, yes. which is what you do. And when it came to languages, she was multilingual. And um, we had a large library in the house. So to me, to have a large library is, you know, necessary yeah. uh, and normal. Yeah. Um, my father's um, medical books were up in the attic. There was a large room in the attic very large across the whole back of the house. One side was his stuff, and we used to look at all the diseases oh and pictures of stuff like that. <laughs> and I do have a, I had to decide whether to be a doctor or, or to go elsewhere. And uh, my mother had all the forbidden books that were on the, um, what they call it, the index of forbidden books. They were all up in the attic. And I mean, if you have Guy de Maupassant on the, you know, the Three Musketeers, something was wrong with you when you put the Three Musketeers on forbidden book. Yeah. So, but she had all of them. We used to go up there. There was lots of places to sit down and read. Mm -hmm. And then downstairs, she, she had the uh, Harvard classics, which were acceptable. <laughs> if Harvard <laughs> says it's okay, it must be okay. <laughs> Peg, we can't thank you enough for inviting us into your studio. I know you have students here all of the time, but just to be here as an observer and to take in the scope 
of your interests and your history and your family stories. We were really honored and thank you so much. Thank you for your great questions <laughs> because you unleashed most of those answers. Well, I just, I feel that there's never enough time. We would spend months here together um, because every question leads to another one, leads to another one, and that really was just a, a skimming of the surface, but we'll be visiting again in person when possible and, uh, at, so. and po at programs out in the community, and we'll be doing other programs as the years unfold. And uh, we hope you all stay tuned, and thank you all for tuning in today for the second Sunday Folk Arts Series with the Everhart Museum. And our partners, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, we thank them as well for making this possible. My name is Kimberly Crafton, and we look forward to seeing you next month on the second Sunday. Thank you, and have a beautiful afternoon.